Good afternoon, Pfizer Board of Directors. Thank you so much for inviting us, Madam Ed Consulting, to offer an analysis on the current pricing of Xandi and any potential ethical implications that might be involved. My name is Joseph Kulo. I'm Dominic Garcia. I'm Christopher Mendoza. I'm Jillian Watkins. I'm Eric Quinn. A little bit about our company before we get started. We were founded in sunny California, and we have over 25 years of experience in the industry. Not only that, but we specialize in healthcare and medical services. So you should be in good hands with us today. A little bit about our agenda and key objectives. We're going to analyze an ethical issue involved with the current price of Xtandi and offer a feasible recommendation. From there, we will engage in three analyses. The first will be the legal analysis, where we'll look at some legal cases and the current legal situation around the pricing of Xtandi and how this supports the recommendation. Secondly, we'll go into the financial analysis, which will look at your financials and how, once again, it supports the recommendation. And thirdly, we'll go into the ethical analysis itself. And this will also be broken into three sections. The first being the impact on society, the impact on individuals, and the impact on your company. Before we continue, we wanted to draw from your mission statement. So reading from your mission statement, it reads that your company wishes to become the world's most valued company to patients, customers, colleagues, investors, business partners, and the communities where we work and live. Honestly, our team couldn't agree more with your mission statement. Some background, Xtandi is actually your brand name for the generic drug enzalutamide which is an androgen receptor inhibitor. It goes miles to treating prostate cancer. And it was licensed as a patent to Medivation in 2005, approved by the FDA in 2012, and then finally acquired by your company in 2016. The recommended dosage for Xtandi is 160 milligrams a day. This can be done in two different ways. Firstly, it can be done with two 80 milligram pills or four 40 milligram pills. While we were conducting our analyses, we did uncover an important ethical issue. Despite being a publicly subsidized drug, many Americans cannot afford a standing. To put it simply, they're being priced out of life. Because of this, our recommendation is that the pricing of Xtandi should be lowered so that it's more financially accessible to the public. With this in mind, my associate Dominic yeah, it's going to take us into the first analysis, which will cover the legal section. Thank you very much, Joseph. Hello, good afternoon, Pfizer Board of Directors. Just to refresh your memory, my name is Dominic Garcia, and this afternoon I'll be doing the legal presentation for you, legal portion of this presentation. Thank you. I'd like to draw your attention to the intellectual property slide. On screen, you'll see three patents that UCLA still owns, and this is out of a total of four. And as you may recall, my colleague Joseph had mentioned, um, mentioned facts about Xtandi's personal background and how it's had quite an interesting journey to reach where it's at today. And this includes funding from the private and public sector for the clinical research and all their trials, then being approved as a patent, licensed out to Medivation, then, uh, then acquired by Pfizer in 2016. However, I would now like to draw your attention to the three expiration dates that you see on screen here. By 2027, you'll be losing three of your formula, three out of four of your formulas of one of your powerhouse essential medications. So by 2026 and by 2027, your competitors will be able to be or will be able to sell your drug. Thankfully, you will still have the name Xtandi. However, they will be selling their version of as enzalutamide at a much cheaper margin. And as we as we get closer to these dates, you'll start seeing more and more issues. As some of your competitors may be a tad bit ambitious by starting out early by creating or by infringing on your patents much sooner than than the expected date. I would now like to discuss with you all the Bipedal Act and marching rights. On the previous slide, I had mentioned that Xtandi had received public and federal funding during their initial startup research. And this includes the public funds from UCLA, federal funding from the, National, uh, from the Department of Defense and other subsidies from the National Institute of Health. And the reason why that is relevant, Board of Directors, is that this section of intellectual property law, property law actually pertains to universities, nonprofit organizations, and small businesses that use, um, that receive public or federal funding for their inventions. And in return for the inventor to maintain ownership of their patent and of their invention, the US government is allowed merchant rights. 
And this allows the US government to essentially invalidate a patent if they deem it to be inaccessible to the majority to a, of consumers. And again, you may be wondering, why are we presenting this legal information in today's presentation? As you may know, prior to your acquisition of the rights of Extandi in 2016, there was the first attempt on this essential medication of marching rights. However, this petition was brought down. Then in 2022, there was a new attempt on marching rights. On screen here, for the second petition of marching rights on the grounds that the drug was too expensive and inaccessible to many Americans, all these supporters on screen had signed the petition, had signed in support of the drug. So we would just like to pose the question, what are the ethical implications of powerhouses such as Harvard of getting involved and having a say in, this, um, in the pricing of this drug? And on the very first slide, I had our on the intellectual property slide, I had mentioned of the possible lawsuits as you get closer to the expiration dates of your patents. In late 2023, there was a settlement between Pfizer, Estellas, and UCLA against Sun Pharmaceuticals for patent infringements. Sun Pharmaceuticals was one of your overly ambitious competitors who began creating their own generic version of enzalutamide in attempts to make, in attempts to undercut the profit, um, undercut Pfizer's profit and a secure a portion of the market. And this, this is why we believe our recommendation is very important. Before you lose three, three of your formulas, you're still able to secure a portion of the market by having a lower price essential mess. And next, we would also like to bring to your attention the increased pressures to utilize margin rights. As this latest lawsuit has brought it extended back into the conversation of drug cap pricing. Well, it's bringing back into the conversation, why is this drug so expensive? Why are there competitors infringing on these patents so early? Why are these actions being taken place in the first, uh, why are these actions being made in the first place? And finally, we would like to bring another form of government interference to your attention. If in all of 40 years, that has never been one successful case of marching rights at, at, under the Bayh-Dole Act. However, it is becoming increasingly close that Pfizer will be the very first and the Xtandi will be the very first drug and it being an essential medication, it, it's not looking good, frankly. However, there's still the possibility that the US government may enact legislation to add an unfavorable price cap. So what happened with insulin? Insulin is an essential medication taken daily. I, myself, as a diabetic, I do take insulin daily, almost as much as someone non extending or who takes extending for their treatments. And in my case, the US government had stepped in and put a price cap. However, and this is such a precedent actually for the very um, for future medications that are essential. I'll now be transitioning to the financial aspect for my colleague Chris providing more details. Thank you. Thank you, Dominic, for that excellent legal analysis. Let's now move forward in the journey as we approach the financial aspect of this consultation. The main goal of this portion is to explain our thought process behind the recommendations that we have at the end and to better explain the strategies and how we came up with these strategies to help become a company revenue. Now, the goal, again, is to increase company revenue while also helping the, cover, the, the company to fulfill its social responsibility in terms of ethics to society. In order to do so, we will cover three main points. First, we'll take a look at the industry in which Pfizer conducts business. Second, we will take a look at Pfizer as a company, assess it in terms of revenue and growth. And finally, we'll zoom in on Xtandi, the star of this presentation, take a look at it in terms of revenue within the company and how it is affecting consumers. So let's begin. As you can see, the brand pharmaceutical industry is projected for steady growth. And this is no surprise for, and this is great news for Pfizer, owning a staggering 13.9% of market share. They are first amongst its competitors. This is a true testament to Pfizer as a leader, as a dominator, and as an innovator in this industry, it was a true testament to its capabilities. When we look at Pfizer in terms of revenue, in 2023, Pfizer generated a staggering $58.5 billion in annual revenue with 9.8 annual growth over the last four years. Now, with this, there's also another side to it. Bad news in the most recent quarter, 2023 quarter four, show that many of Pfizer's top products are generating little to no growth. Pfizer, Pfizer reported a loss of $3.4 billion with revenue tanking over 41%. Now, Pfizer, this is not entirely bad news, or it is not a race, but a marathon. And this is the reason why you called us here today for your consultation needs. We truly hope that you take our recommendations to mind in order to help increase company revenue and solidify your place in the industry. Now, when we zoom in on Xtandi, 
R&D costs amounted to $1.4 billion in research and development. Fortunately, there was some public funding involved, including a government subsidy of $500,000. Uh, in the most recent year, 2023, Pfizer actually generated $1.2 billion in revenue alone, being one of Pfizer's top selling products. Now, how does this translate to the consumer and how are we affecting them? Each pill of Xtandi costs a staggering $250, coming out to $15,000 in cost every single month. I actually have here in the bottle 3D printed Xtandi representing $15,000 within this little bottle alone. It is no surprise that consumers can simply not afford it, and it is no surprise why we must reconsider this as a social, uh, it, reconsider your social responsibility as a leader within the industry. This is a great segue into the ethical portion, so we'll now move forward as my colleague Julian will take over. Thank you so much for that, Chris. We'll now be diving into the ethical analysis of our presentation. This portion will be broken up into three parts. The impact on society, onto the individual, and finally onto the company itself. Now, as been well established, Xtandi has been created thanks in large part due to government subsidies, such as those from the NIH and Department of Defense. Medicare also considers Xtandi as Medicare. Medicare is also a huge stream of revenue for Xtandi, for Pfizer. In fact, Medicare has paid out over two point six billion dollars in terms of Xtandi in two thousand twenty two. And Medicare also considers Xtandi as one of the top 10 drugs in terms of costliness to them. It is also important to note that despite taxpayers, American taxpayers, trading having a large part in the world creation of this drug, Americans are paying on average three to six times more as compared to other high income earning countries, such as Japan and Canada, where a pill in Japan and Canada of 40 milligrams is only compared to is only $20 as compared to $136 and some change in the United States. And this price tag has doubled since, since Xandy's first, first launch. Prostate cancer is also a huge impact on Americans. Prostate cancer is the second most deadliest cancer in the United States, only behind lung cancer. Over 3 million men are currently diagnosed with prostate cancer and one in eight men will be diagnosed in the lifetimes. This diagnosis will also be projected to double by the year 2040. And this also can, prostate cancer also seems to demonstrate a racial disparity compared, comparing black Americans and white Americans. Black men on average are two times as likely to get diagnosed with prostate cancer, two times as likely to get diagnosed with Lay on stage prostate cancer, that of which Xtandi is created to treat, and two times as likely to die from prostate cancer. We'll now be diving into the individual part, individual impact onto society. Thanks to my colleague, Eric. Thank you very much, Jillian. I'd like to thank you, board of directors, for being here on this rainy afternoon. I understand it's rainy, but I appreciate you guys taking the time out of your day to listen to our, our ethical analysis on this topic. So my colleague Jillian talked a little bit about how this issue is impacting society as a whole. However, however I'd like to draw your attention to the individuals within our society that are being impacted by this high price point. So we see that many individuals who are unable to afford expanding through their own personal funding are turning to alternative methods of funding a popular one being crowdfunding, and a popular website for crowdfunding being GoFundMe. My colleagues and I found multiple people on Go, the GoFundMe website who are raising money for their prostate cancer treatment, one particular individual being a man named Paul Stercheck, who in 2023 raised about $30,000 for his prostate cancer treatment, a large portion of that owing to the cost of expanding. Paul Stercheck, along with many of the other individuals on GoFundMe, are taxpaying individuals within the United States whose money helped fund the research and development for Xtandi, yet they aren't reaping the benefits of that money. We also understand that this issue is not solely linked to Xtandi and your company's price points. We see that other industries, like the insulin industry, have faced similar ethical issues with their high price points. A particular case study was done with a woman named Jada Lewis, who has been a type 1 diabetic since the age of seven. And in 2019, she was faced with a difficult issue, either pay her rent for that month or pay her $300 cost of insulin. She found herself in the hospital for about a week and eventually after being released, 
owing to her rationing of her insulin. She was found dead in her home. Now, this is brutal. This is very harsh, but we wanted to make you aware of these facts. This issue was going on. We wanted to make sure that you're aware that this is happening with individuals in your community. As, as your mission statement states, we understand that your goal is to create as much value for individuals within your community. And we believe Extandy does that. As we see, individuals who take Extandy are 34% less likely to die than if they hadn't taken Extandy. And we want to make sure that you continue to capture that market share and continue to help the people within your communities to the best of your ability. Next, I'm going to talk a little bit about the implications that this has on individuals in terms of procuring their drugs internationally. So we see that individuals owing to cheaper prices in international markets are turning to other countries to buy their drugs. Now, this poses two problems for you. We see that individuals leaving the country and going into these international markets are buying drugs in countries where your sphere of influence is lost. We see that they're going into markets that you can't capture, and we want to make sure they're able to continue capturing that market share. Additionally, we see that individuals going to these international markets are procuring drugs that are not regulated at the same standards that you wish to regulate your drugs at, or that the FDA legally requires our drugs to be regulated at. And again, we know that your goal is to continue having this profound impact that you've had on individuals. So we want to make sure you continue to do that. And we think our recommendation helps to do just that. Lastly, I'm going to talk a little bit about the rights between some of your key stakeholders. So again, as your mission statement outlines, some of your primary stakeholders are your patients, which I've talked a little bit about, but also your, uh, your shareholders and your employees. Now we understand that our recommendation creates a conflict between the rights of some of these individuals as your patients will be happy in the short term and long term due to the reduced price. However, some of your shareholders might be concerned with lost profits, but we believe in the long term, our recommendation strives to strike a balance between these conflicts as in the long term, the positive publicity that this will generate for you and your company in addition to the larger market share that this will capture, will ultimately positively benefit Pfizer. With stakeholders in mind, I would now like to pass it off to my colleague, Joseph, who will talk a little bit about the impact on your company. Thank you so much, Derek. So as he said, Extandi does not only impact stakeholders external to the company, but also stakeholders within your own company. It does this in three different ways, the current pricing situation. Firstly, because it creates this threat of new entrants into the market. Secondly, because of the threat of government interference. And thirdly, the negative publicity. So in the first case, as my associates Dominic and Chris mentioned, that once your patents expire in 2026 and 2027, new competitors will enter the marketplace. Two examples of these are Sun Pharmaceutical Industries, who have developed a generic version of Xtandi, and also Mark Cuban's cost plus drug company, which seeks to eliminate the middleman between the producer and the consumer. With these competitors coming into the market, there's a potential hit to profits, which potentially also hits the well being of your internal stakeholders. In addition, there is truly this threat of government interference. Our analysis has shown that over the last few years, there's been increasing drive for the government to do something about drug prices, whether it be through exercising margin rights or enacting legislation, as my associate Dominic mentioned. In addition, as I'm sure you're all aware, we're in an election year, and the regulatory impact of this election is still uncertain. It could go a variety of different ways. And thirdly, there is this idea of negative publicity. Your company has unfortunately come under some scrutiny due to the pricing of drugs. For example, during the COVID-19 pandemic, there was a great deal of scrutiny due to the fact that while millions of Americans were suffering and losing jobs and well-being, your company's profits doubled. The question in the air is, why is this ethical? So in terms of this, our analysis has shown that customers are generally satisfied. However, there is a great potential for a negative change. In conclusion, all three elements of our ethical analysis whether they be looking at the negative impact that current pricing is having on external stakeholders, whether it be a societal or on an individual basis or on your own internal stakeholders, it falls under this umbrella of corporate social responsibility, which is a business model that proposes that your company contributes to society in a way that reflects your values. 
Now, whether or not you wish to implement this business model, it's important to note that there's a driving social pressure to do so. So while this um, creates a certain obstacle, it also creates opportunity where you could be at the forefront of the pharmaceutical industry in leading the way in terms of corporate social responsibility. So with all of this in mind, our recommendation is once again that the pricing of Xtandi should be lowered. We recommend this on three counts, the positive impact to society, the positive impact to individuals who struggle to afford this essential drug, and also the positive impact it gives to your internal stakeholders by giving you more flexibility in terms of, um, excuse me, in terms of your pricing of Xtandi. So I'm sure you have some questions as to the practical application of this recommendation. Before we leave you today, my associate Chris wanted to share a few thoughts on how we can go about setting lost profits. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, my name is Christopher Mendoza. Thank you so much for uh, the, the staying through the consultation. Let's now wrap it up. I, you might be wondering, keeping these recommendations in mind, how can we put it into practice? We recommend it with the following strategies. First, we look at the cap dynamic demand pricing, which can be seen in France's legislation. In France, pharmaceutical companies are actually placed with a quota for revenue. And once that quota is reached for that certain medication, further pricing is reduced, therefore allowing, allowing consumers and patients to have access to the medication that they need. We recommend this as well. Uh, and secondarily, a two-sided pricing model should be adopted. It has become a very clear, uh, looking at the most quarter recently review, that there needs to be a change in the model, a change in the way you approach drug pricing. So in order to do so, a two-sided approach looks at shifting pricing from one side to another. Specifically in this situation, we recommend shifting the price of essential drugs like Xtandi to non-essential drugs, cosmetic drugs, therefore allowing for not only revenue, revenue and company growth, but allowing you to keep that ethical uh, branding that is in the, in the consumer's mind. If we see here in this graph, this left one represents Xtandi or essential drugs, and the square represents revenue. By lowering the price of Xtandi and shifting it to non-essential drugs representing on the left side, you will not only guarantee revenue, but you'll be capturing higher margins, where the blue square represents the old pricing and the revenue to that, and the red square represents the new revenue. It more than compensates for the losses in revenue in, in Xtandi, and it also solidifies the social responsibility that is required for you as a leader in the company. Now, Pfizer, it is about the long term and not the short term. We truly believe in your potential as a company, and as your mission statement states, it's about being an innovator and solidifying that position for the years to come. For that reason, Pfizer, we highly recommend that you take these strategies into mind and we sincerely look forward to the next step in, this, in, the, in the process. Thank you so much for allowing us to be here today. And now we are ready for any questions that you may have. Thank you. I have a question. Um, thank you for the information. I'm wondering what makes this issue that you're discussing an ethical issue? Thank you so much for your question. So I would say it, something in the nature of healthcare and medicine inherently ties this to ethics. With healthcare, the goal is to treat and assist individuals, people. And whenever people are involved, ethics comes into it because at the core of society, it's about people. And with, with the medical field, ultimately you're handling people's lives. And I, I would say that's why ethics is intrinsically tied. Thank you for your question. And if you wouldn't mind me adding on, thank you very much for your question. We also believe that this is a very prevalent issue as the research and development for this drug was fu funded in part due to public subsidies, which means we believe it should be inherently accessible to the public that it's meant to be assisting, such as the men like Paul Sterichek, who I mentioned earlier in my presentation. We think him and other taxpayers should see the benefits of the publicly funded drug that they helped the research process. And so the high price point sort of creates an ethical dilemma, as my colleague was mentioning, between the consumer and, and your company. So a quick follow-up for my colleagues on that questions. Um, how are you able to know exactly what our price points are? How do you know 
how much money we have raised above what you think is fair and appropriate. I mean, it's easy for anyone to say that anything is, is higher priced. It's said with insulin, it's said with a whole host of things. Although with insulin, apparently, the price has a lot more than just the cost. It's all of the equipment, et cetera, that needs to be done. So I don't know on what basis you're making an assumption that we at Pfizer is um, deliberately or whatever, expecting to create far more income than you feel we are entitled to, because you don't know. Yes, that's a great question. I would love to answer it. Thank you for that question. Um, essentially, the price point, the first question that you mentioned, how do we approach or reach that price point? We would love to consult further with your business departments, your marketing departments, and finance departments to come up with that specific price point. However, to further justify, if I can go back here, you mentioned how can we justify the, the reduction in price and how will that continue to benefit you as a company, which is a great point to make. As we see here on the left side, this is a price times quantity chart. By lowering the price of Xtandi, not only will it allow you to have access to more consumers, you'll tap into a market that currently is not being accessed. Additionally, by increasing the, the price, as you can see here, representing on the vertical access, you'll be reaching a higher price point, therefore more revenue and non-essential drugs. Now that also benefits you in the long term for your brand and the impression in the consumer's mind, it'll be much more positive. And it's a great opportunity for you as Pfizer to be the, not only the leader in the industry as you already are, but to really change the way that we see drug pricing change the way that we see pharmaceutical companies, therefore more, more so solidifying you as a brand being Pfizer. Which of my colleagues would like to, both those who are on Zoom and here, who would like to say something next? A couple of questions. Michael, you can, you're on mute, Michael. You can go first. I see his mouth moving out. I think he, he's still on mute. <laughs> Okay. I okay, I'll, I'll give it a go. I think Michael is trying to answer the question, but it's not coming through. Um, so I, I'm def I understand the position. I understand the ethical dilemma about pricing. Um, so I'm Cy Bryant. So I've been in the pharmacy industry for like 24 years now, and this is absolutely an ongoing debate. I think one of the key things to consider is I understand the $500,000 investment by the federal government. That's so minuscule compared to how much money it costs to develop a drug. And I want you to really consider and probably respond back with, what programs do we have that are not working? So for all of our drugs, we have a medical access program that helps people that can't afford the drug get access to the drug. So do you have an idea of how many people actually are paying out of pocket versus going to a pharmacy manager or some insurance company or on Medicaid that actually are not paying out of pocket as we're focused on the patient? So do you have an idea of how many people actually are paying out of pocket and who this would actually impact by lowering the cost? Thank you for your question. Uh, I think this is a question that me and my colleagues can collaborate with. Uh, but to answer the first question, how much does it cost a consumer out of, or a patient out of pocket cost? That would essentially be 120 to $130 per 40 milligram pill or $250 per 80 milligram pill. Um, then being prescribed 160 milligrams per day amounts to $15,000 minimum out of pocket cost to consumers. Um, more, more so, my colleague Eric also mentioned that many are turning to GoFundMe and other go, uh, crowdfunding sources in order to raise funds for this drug. Like you mentioned, Paul Surchek, a father of uh, three kids, was really trying hard to combat his, his prostate cancer. He raised $30,000 from, crowdfund, from crowdfunding sources which amounts to only two months of medication. I'd also like to add on to that question, if I may add, or uh, to that answer, if I may add. Um, as you know, Medicare, Medicare, while Medicare does pay for a large portion of patients, as you may know, Pfizer is also in current negotiations with Medicare because Medicare recognizes how much it has been paying out of pocket for these patients. 
the current negotiations are that if you come to if you do not come to agreement within the next five years, you may be imposed with a 95% excise tax. And if you back away from any negotiations, Medicare will Medicare is uh, basically stating that they will no longer be providing for Xtandi if are, your drug prices are not lowered specifically for Xtandi and a couple other ones, but Xtandi specifically. I would also add, like to add one more point. Thank you very much, Jillian, and thank you for your question. While we recognize at the beginning of your question, you mentioned the $500,000 federal subsidy, we would also like to mention that the initial development for Xtandi came from the research and development through UCLA, which is a publicly subsidized university as well. So we think that's pertinent because, yes, while the government only gave while the government only gave the research process $500,000, the bulk of the initial research and development also came from a university that is publicly funded as well. So the entire initial development of the process was, was publicly funded. Just to add on to sort of that first point. I have a question about your stakeholders and your patients. You mentioned that a lot of the users of Xtandi have diabetes and need to take insulin. And then we also mentioned prostate cancer. So what is the nexus between diabetes and prostate cancer? Are we talking about patients who have the diabetes and also prostate cancer? Thank you for your question. Uh, very good question. However, we use insulin as an anecdote to compare to Xtandi, uh, like my colleague Dominic will expand on. Uh, they essentially, it plays the cap on insulin, it being very essential, and it can follow on the same lines as Xtandi. Uh, so for that reason, it's not necessarily about someone having diabetes and a prostate cancer. Uh, we use it as a way to uh, explain how it already happened in the real world and how it might parallel to Xtandi as well, uh, thereby being patients with prostate cancer who need the anti inhibitor uh, to help them with their, their cancer treatment. And Dominic also mentioned that you can expand on it. No, um, Chris did a very good job um, pointing out, but I was explaining as a diabetic, I take insulin daily while someone with Xtandi is taking 160 milligrams daily. And as my colleague Chris was saying, in the financial aspect, those dollars tend to add up to a month, two months, $30,000. So just putting an example, one is an expensive essential medication received a price cap to another essential medication, which is more on the chopping block for a price cap, one that may be unfavorable to Pfizer. So which is why we're recommending that you get ahead of it so that you're, you tend to save face and you're, you're able to profit still. Thank you. I have a quick follow up. We've probably all heard in the news that OJ Simpson recently died of prostate cancer, and Lloyd Austin, the Secretary of Defense, was in the hospital for about two weeks off and on with complications. So, does Meta Med see these high profile cases as marketing opportunities for us? Thank you so much for the question. It, it is an interesting one. I, I could see a couple of different ways of looking at it. Um, potentially, in terms of relating it to people who are unable to afford Xtandi, it might be difficult. However, you know, human life is human life, and being able to help anybody, whether no matter where their position is in life with prostate cancer, I, I mean, I could see it as a potential marketing opportunity. If I can uh, add on to uh, Joseph's uh, answer. Uh, thank you, Board Director, for your question. Uh, where is the marketing opportunity? Essentially, there's an untapped market, them being the lower income that is inaccessible at the moment, not being touched, especially uh, for this drug as well, it being uh, patented by Pfizer. Uh, so there's a new market, or a complete market that's not being touched at the moment. So you, you would widen that, that reach, that market reach, allowing for higher quantity purchases, as well as the fact that, like uh, Dominic mentioned, there, would be, there is a threat of margin rights which will place a cap on the price of Xtandi, which will mean instead of you controlling yourself, the price of Xtandi, the government might come and place a cap themselves. Thereby, thereby, you will not be in control of how much revenue or what the profit margin would be for your drug. So it's about getting ahead and you know, preparing for the storm. And instead of just waiting, it's, it's about preparing and getting ready for the storm before it arrives. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is there another prostate drug um, that is just as efficacious is, is this drug? Well, actually, Xtandi are 
more generally known as enzalutamide, is the first and only kind on the, on the, that's FDA approved. It is an androgen receptor inhibitor, so it mainly treats and targets late on stage prostate cancer that is castrate resistant. So there's different types of prostate cancers, but late on stage prostate cancer has had a high death mortality until drugs like Extandi has come on the market. And unfortunately, Extandi is the only FDA approved androgen anti-androgen receptor inhibitor on the, on the market are also, however, there are still foreign markets that are providing similar types of drugs, but none other like it on the American market. And just to add on to that a little bit, thank you for your question. We recognize that there are other prostate cancer medications. However, as my colleague Jillian was mentioning, this is the only one that deals with the specific type of cancer and acts in the specific way that certain patients require. So it's usually used in combination with other medications that help combat prostate cancer. But as my colleague Jillian was mentioning, this is the only one that does specifically what some prostate cancer treat, uh, patients require. But so basically, there is no competitor. Yes, yes. Essential. Yeah. Yeah. and prostate cancer that is cancer resistant is also the most deadliest type of cancer or prostate cancer. Although I think I would add that, that as we as I meant or as my associate Dominic mentioned, there are potential generic versions that have been developed. For instance, in the case of Sun Pharmaceutical Industries, however, these have not yet been brought to market because your patents are still in force. Great. Okay. So um, have you considered the fact, you mentioned that Pfizer's revenues dropped dramatically in 2023, and we know that's largely because of the, the lack of you know, its COVID products were no longer generating the kind of revenue that they had in prior years, and there's probably no chance that they're ever going to generate that kind of revenue. So Pfizer's focus has shifted now to cancer drugs, and that's where it expects to make up all of this money that it has lost in recent um, Decent times. So, under that theory, um, just thinking in ethics from a from the corporate standpoint, you know, it would seem that before they hit the patent cliff, which is coming up in two to three years, they need to make we need to make as much money as we possibly can during that time frame. When the patent cliff starts to hit, wouldn't that be the time that we actually lower the price of the drug? Because then we'll have competitors from Sun Pharmaceuticals, who knows who else might be out there coming up with you know, a generic version of the drug. Thank you so much for your question. Um, just addressing one specific part of that, we believe, just to, to reiterate your question, just make sure I got understood it correctly. You're saying, Pfizer, you would like to make as much money as possible before competitors come in and before your shares continue to dip, is that? Just to clarify. Yes, yeah, from, right. from a profitability standpoint, Pfizer's in a, right. in, a, in a very difficult position right now because it's lost so much right. revenue from COVID's COVID vaccine products. And it has decided to strategically shift, try to make more money in the cancer space. And this is one of its you know, most promising revenue sources, as you demonstrated with the amount of revenue they brought in in 2023, just with this drug alone. So they would have to, I mean, we would have to actually change our entire strategy by lowering the price of the drug. And we understand that about a, a million percent, which is why I sort of addressed that this is going to create a huge conflict of interest between your shareholders and your employees, as well as your patients. Our ultimate goal, the reason we even bring this topic to you today is because Xtandi is a publicly subsidized drug. So we're not saying that all of your cancer research and your other cancer medications that you're bringing to market, the prices should be dropped on those. However, we believe that with Xtandi in particular, because this is a publicly subsidized drug and it was funded through public means and research and development through UCLA, we understand that R&D is a huge part of your expenses. We believe that other cancer medications could continue to make up a bulk of your profit margins. However, Xtandi, we believe, poses this ethical issue because taxpayers are not seeing the benefit of their funding for this drug. Maybe my colleagues can expand on that a little bit. Yeah, great, great question again. Thank you. And I can definitely see why profitability, profitability is so important. Um, so first, let's keep in mind that not only are their patents expiring, we're approaching election year, and with all the uh, the government volatility that might come with that, 
Uh, there's also marching rights at the back, knocking on the door, where at any moment the government may come, it being an essential drug, to place that cap. So it's not only the patents that's beckoning at the door, uh, beckoning at the door, but it's also the the potential price cap that might come. Uh, secondarily, like you mentioned, right now Pfizer is in the headlines. Everyone knows Pfizer now, especially because of COVID vaccine. It's a great opportunity to now make a shift uh, to non-essential drugs and essentially experiment, make them uh, try to see how it affects the company in terms of market revenue. Uh, because right now there's a once in a lifetime opportunity with COVID just you know just ending to to make this shift and they're right shifting the focus to non-essential drugs. If I can add to that as well, the second highest generating drug is not an essential drug. It is a drug that just helps with nervous system, uh, helps with symptoms. So it shows that non-essential drugs are also generating a lot of growth and they can take this chance to use Xtandi as a specific uh, example to see if further drugs, other essential drugs can approach the same model. So this is a great opportunity for Xtandi to be uh, that example that this would work. So by shifting that revenue from non-essential to essential, you'll be capturing much larger revenue that will owe more than compensate for the loss that comes from uh, Xtandi's reduction. I would also add on, sorry, um, but I, not only are, pets are not the only thing that may be imposed upon your company. You, as I, I mentioned, Medicare and you are in current negotiations to lower the pricing because Medicare can no longer keep paying out what they have in $2.6 billion in 2022, which was half of Xtandi's revenue. So if Medicare backs off the table and no longer provides for Xtandi, you are potentially losing half of your revenue. Um, and the, these negotiations are possibly likely to close in as soon as November, or not November, August. Oh, no, so it could be this year. Sorry. I would also like to add a brief point. At the very end, you mentioned why not just wait until these uh, these jurisdictions and sanctions are placed on us and tackle it then. However, we believe with our recommendation, our goal is to get a jump on that. And we understand, as you said, this is going to be a huge market shift for us and require a lot of planning. It's going to completely change the profit margins, which is, again, why we're recommending now before these these further implications impact our company and your company, excuse me, and you guys are unable to properly address it at that time in a more compressed manner. So just to follow up to that, why wouldn't we implement um, more patient assistance programs instead of lowering the price? Have you looked at that possibility? So do you mean uh, as in like in-house type of insurance? Well, most pharmaceutical companies offer patient assistance programs for those that do not have the economic means to afford the drug. So why not just expand that program, make it more widely available, rather than doing a blanket decrease in the price of the drug? We know that marching rights have rarely been used in the United States. And NIH's position is that um, marching rights are not the way to go to try to lower pricing. So we've already sort of got, you know, the government naysaying this approach. So what, um, you know, what are the uh, downsides to the alternative of increasing the patient assistance program? Thank you so much. I think to address part of your question, it is true that the Biden administration has said that it will not use marching rights at this time. However, it has repeatedly emphasized that it is still an option on the table. In addition, uh, in terms of the uh, rest of your question, perhaps some of my associates might like to chime in, but in terms of that point, it is a very real threat. It's about essentially controlling the situation because there's an enormous amount of unpredictability that comes with your patents expiring. So being able to get a jump on the situation, controlling it, as opposed to having it, uh, someone else control it for you. Uh, it, it's essentially, as my associate Chris said, that it's about looking to the long term, not just the short term in terms of, you know, between now and when patents expire, but in the long term, in terms of the distant future. And uh, you know, again, Pfizer's your own brand image, your reputation, your potential to lead the way in the pharmaceutical industry. There are enormous intangible benefits as well, such as brand image again, and, um, you know, the fulfilling that sense of corporate social responsibility. 
And just to further add on to that, I believe the ethical implications of lowering your price can be much more profound as you can be an industry leader that other markets are able to see that Pfizer is taking action to cut their prices instead of just expanding a program that we're not seeing much much utilization with right now. The expansion project, we have not done much research into that. We could do further research for you if you would like. However, we believe that there would have to be great marketing that would have to go into this expansion project and that would be a further expense on your company to make sure that consumers are aware of this new pre uh pardon me of the of your ability to help subsidize some of their costs whereas the pricing might have a more profound impact on society as they're able to see that pfizer is acting in a manner with societies with ethical consideration and trying to help provide a positive impact for society. Did that answer your question sufficiently? Yes. To uh, add a little bit, I want to give an example of the two-sided pricing model. Um, we can see this in Visa. Visa does not charge for consumers for having a credit card in terms of direct fees. Yes, there might be annual fees, but the majority of their revenue comes from them charging fees to business and, and the business owners and the fees that they get for using Visa. So if they were to incur higher charges, for example, Visa to the consumer, the consumer can easily move to American Express, other options. So Visa understands that the majority of their market share comes from the business side. So that comes from the two-sided approach, which coincides with what we mentioned, shifting that, for example, from the consumer to the business. And this example will be from non-essential to, or from essential to non-essential drugs. I'm wondering if anyone has any more questions before we move on to the next part. Yes. Anyone else? Okay. Any questions? Then what I'm going to do is uh, we have 20 minutes, and that 20 minutes is really us talking to you as who we are, making suggestions and ideas that may or may not be helpful, but giving you feedback. So, so we're, we can break character. Uh, you are who you are right now. You no longer have to wear a tie or a jacket. It's up to you. Just one shirt. What I um, am wondering, first of all, I, I think you've done a uh, really excellent job. When did you start working on this? I know, but when? I, I would say that we started at the beginning of the semester, but then it wasn't until the second half of the semester that we really started to get going on it. And then it's really intensified over these last three or four weeks. We broke it up into stages. Um, Roxana invited us. She composed the team um, based on our strengths and weaknesses. So the first stage was research, extensive research. After selecting the topic, there was a very talk, uh, various topics that we were looking at. Uh, but after doing some research, we we saw that this is very important for society and very relevant. Um, so after doing that research, we really dove into it, uh, meeting multiple times a week, a lot of time, a lot of energy, but it has been a great experience. It's clear you have a nice team energy of, of connection with each other. Oh. So that says something really important too. Okay. Um, I think all of us have a lot to say. I, I will just start by, did you look at Pfizer's values? Yes. That would have been useful for you to present. For example, the um, equity has everything to do with fair and impartial treatment. And fair treatment could have been something that you could have used with that. Um, courage is something to acknowledge. I think some of the examples you gave of, of the people who have been doing the funding and all of that. It's, it's pretty extreme that one has to do that. But, and then interestingly, um, excellence and joy were part of that. So those were harder, I think, to fit in. But I think clearly the, the equity issue is something that you could have used in your, it's not necessarily, you may use it in the, um, in the uh, 10 minute, mm. but you might want to think about yeah. bringing back values to them. Um, and 
Can I add something on that? I actually did have uh, some emphasis along those lines in that financial portion, uh, but we decided to redistribute uh, that time to the ethical portion and we reduce the financial analysis so it is not, you know, like the prompt says, it is not about. Uh, right, but the point is that. Oh, you're right. That would have been a great point to keep in. The, the, the values speak to ethics, and so that's not up to you all. Thank you. Um, I've got some suggestions, but I want to hear. We haven't heard from our other two judges on the wall. So we they would like to uh, give us some feedback um, for your benefit. Yeah, I will jump in. Um, I, it's a couple of different things. It's one, um, I do understand that the intent of bringing the values. I would let the entire presentation with the patient, the person that's crowdfunding, like I, that would be my first slide. And in delivering that slide, you have to have a somber tone as if someone you know was going through that. And these decisions, these ethical decisions are a lot of times more emotional than anything else. Financially, it's not the right decision to go. Financially, you wait until the cliff comes, then you lower the price. That's just what, what is, is absolutely happening. And the suggestion that came from the room is absolutely correct. Increase the market access to those drugs. So I think one of the things that could absolutely have helped enormously is to reach out to some doctors, some prostate cancer doctors, and ask them, is, has anyone been struggling with access to this drug? That those two things, the patient and the actual person that prescribes the drug is like some of the key things I would have loved for you to spend more time and focus on. Financially, I don't think you would have won us over by saying we will make more money over time because we're going to make the money we're going to make over the next two years until the clip comes. It is, it's guaranteed. So even if you lower the cost, which may be ethical, it won't generate the market or the marketing strategy that you would anticipate what happened, but those community service things, getting out in the community, increasing screening of prostate cancer, partnering with different universities to do that would be enormous. I think the other key thing is to keep in mind is it's not just the upfront research. Research for all the drugs in the pharma industry are, are indefinite. There's like 37 clinical trials just for Extendia right now. And that costs money. So a part of those drug pricing actually contributes to helping more people in the future. And so bringing that all together is really focusing on is tying those values to that patient. The patient journey is what sells the different decision-making processes. That being said, you did an excellent job of communicating and, and sharing each other and passing the story off to each other. And it, it was absolutely felt like you've been long, you've been together longer than one semester that you were able to pivot off of each other so easily. So you did a great job in working together as a team. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, I'd like to add some comments, ask a question, and make a suggestion. I agree with Rai that the team was excellent as far as handing off from one speaker to the next, very smooth and nicely orchestrated. Your structure was well organized with the legal issues, the financial issues, and then three sections of the ethical issues. A question which is somewhat <laughs> maybe informal and silly, what does meta mean? Meta, meta med. <laughs> our, our, mask, our school mascot is the matador. So we are meta dash med. Yes. yes. Last year when you presented on chat to BT, we were meta tech. <laughs> so we're expanding our, 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 yeah, our services. Our services. Yeah. We are now a yeah, medical consulting club. We know will be next year. Yes. <laughs> I, I like the name. I was wondering whether you considered MetaMed, but you could have been sued by Facebook if you went with MetaMed. Yeah. Very true. <laughs> okay, and one, one suggestion. I've been a Toastmaster for a number of years, and a Toastmaster's when we give an evaluation, we always make a suggestion on how to improve. So my suggestion is that in addition to the financial, the legal, and the ethical, you could have added a section on the medical issues. You did touch on the insulin and the diabetes, which was good, but you might have focused 
more specifically on the medical issues in addition to the legal, financial, and ethical. Over. So are you talking about like symptoms that prostate, prostate cancer patients are experiencing? That could have been part of it. I'm, I'm not oh. necessarily recommending specifics, but like the, the question, like the nexus between the prostate cancer and the diabetes, that wasn't clear to me, but as a board member, it should have been perhaps. <laughs> Thank you very Thank much. You. We Thank have you. 10 minutes left. And um, what I want to do is talk about tomorrow. You have a 10 minute and you have a 90 second. And I'm wondering who's doing what tomorrow. So uh, I will be doing the 90 seconds. Um, I'll do those three. So, as you've heard a lot of things that he said, what is it that we can do to be helpful to you regarding how effective you want to be in the 10 minute and regarding the um, 90 seconds? Thanks. Thank you. I actually was hoping to ask you guys uh, that question for or not y'all uh, for this recommendation for help for tomorrow. Um, I guess for me, for the 90 second, I would love help on uh, what points should I be touching on? Because I know it mentions uh, it's a purely ethical, it's an elevator pitch. Should I just disregard all financial and legal issues and focus? Okay. Well, you'll ruin it because <laughs> the, the direction, I mean, you'll ruin your opportunity to be heard okay. by the judges because all is being asked of you is imagine you're an employee of the company where your case, where whose case you've been studying. So you're no longer who you are. Tomorrow you are an employee. And so you're at a meeting at which people are discussing the issue. However, no one has brought up ethics. There's a pause in the conversation. You have 90 seconds in which to convince the other people at the meeting that they are that there are ethical issues that need to be addressed. You don't have to argue for a solution. You just need them to see that these are serious ethical issues. Okay. So All you right. can do anything you want that will allow you to create uh, the space of why this is important and why your colleagues should agree. Okay, phenomenal. Thank you. So one thing I, I would say is I, I think this is about car. And so, although you sort of have these very vague allusions to harm, you don't come right out and say, we are harming people who have this kind of prostate cancer by keeping this drug price so elevated that it's out of reach for them. Well, uh, and, you know, it's just like, you know, a doctor is not supposed to do any harm, right? Well, Pfizer should not be doing any harm either. But, you know, by making sure that the majority of Americans cannot access this drug. They are, in effect, harming people. Thank you so much for that. So essentially, they may, need to fulfill their social responsibility um, to ensure that they're not. I mean, harmed. it's basic humanity, right? Yeah, that's <laughs> true. Thank you. Really painful. You could do the "What if a member of your family?" Oh, okay. I. There's a number of things you can do. This is a kind of heart thing yes. that you that you respond out of your own humanity and. What you want your company to stand for. Thank you. Uh, I'm so glad you mentioned that because I was wondering, I'm a very emotional speaker. I like to really get passionate. Um, I really held back because I wanted yeah. to keep the professional tone. Should I allow myself to? You should, you should allow yourself to do what you feel is the, the way you would behave in a situation like that and how you would want to get things across. Thank you. Thank you for the rest. Ten, One point, I just want to share with you really fast. Yeah, yes, like, question that these question. kind of when these kind of different decisions are made, these are not financial or organizational decisions. It's it's an executive making an emotional decision, and so you have to tap into that emotion. And so, if any of you feel comfortable sharing, if anyone in your family has prostate cancer, that's what you talk about. Perfect. That's right. That's my idea. Thank you. One point for framing the 90 second presentation is that typically we describe a 90 second talk as an elevator speech. So looking at your slides and your 25 minute presentation, 
distilling what's most important, what your key takeaways are. I like the, the way that you mentioned corporate social responsibility. That's a good theme to hit. And definitely for the 92nd, if you can add some emotional vocal variety, that will sell well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your recommendation. So now we have 10. Oh, well, okay. Well, no, so I just care about the both. I mean, you're in good shape. We're going to talk about the 10 minutes. Yes. Okay. So, what have we said or done that changes, if anything, you're going to do? Did you have any additional ideas? Is there something you want from us in terms of supporting you for this 10 minutes? Well, we were, when we were coming up with our presentation, uh, we had to present, present to some of our faculty members at CSUN, and what we actually got back as feedback was to make it less emotional. So I think we were on the right track. In 10 minutes shouldn't be emotional. Right. True. Not at all. Yeah, not You're a professional, and you are coming back only because they've asked you to talk about ethics, because they had some you know, more interest in that. I think that the emotional aspect is perfect for, for somebody who is trying to persuade colleagues. But let's get back to the 10 minute. Yeah. I think we are going to incorporate more probably of like the ethical considerations about like people are going to die if they can't receive this medication, sort of what you're talking about. Uh, yeah, I think the general structure we were thinking of sort of patterning the same sort of, you know, the societal individual and uh, company basis, but again, maybe like be a little bit more explicit in terms of, yeah, if people die and all this is going on because of the situation. Well, but you keep in mind, you are still talking to Pfizer. Yes. And yes. so you, and you're still supposedly a uh, consultant mm -hmm. who wants the job right. to work yeah. with yeah. Pfizer. So, just think about how you would convey what you think is the most important. And you can take obviously pieces from, from this, but. And in terms of like, uh, since we're coming back, we've been invited back, should it be entirely new ethical content or, should, or is, it okay to, is it okay to go over the same? I think it's, it's useful for you to talk about what's the most important. Mm -hmm. And it's useful for you to include whatever is new that you think is important. Um, because whether somebody has heard the 10 minute before and you happen to get the same judge, the reality is just that you're making, I don't want to call it a pitch, you're making, um, you're making your knowledge and what you think is most important to the company to show up in what you're trying to do. Because it's about the company and it's about your brain waves that are demonstrating why this should happen. Because there are people who would probably say that this isn't a solution. Mm. You believe it is a solution and you need to, I don't want to say sell it because it sounds like, you know, whatever, but you need, you need to bring all that you have to whatever it is you want heard. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it makes perfect sense. It's very valuable. No, no, that makes perfect sense. I just have a follow-up yeah. question to that, and I think it was a question that was raised on the presentation, is would you feel comfortable setting a price point before you did your 10-minute discussion? Because here's the thing, right? Ethics is a spectrum. You, you saying it's ethical to lower price almost doesn't have as much meaning unless you say what the price is you're talking about. You could say lower the price by $10. Okay, that's your ethics. Or are you talking about lower by $100? What are you really talking about that will make a big difference while still maintaining profit? So it's something to think about. I'm not telling you to change it. It's saying something to think about. Uh, and just as a follow-up to that, we sort of emphasized in our presentation that we couldn't necessarily do that because we don't have access to all of Pfizer's financial records. So in part of our role play, it was you could call us back for a more in-depth analysis and we could pitch a price point to you then if we could look at your books and work with your marketing and financial and team. It take too much time. Yeah. And, and we just don't have access to that. And yeah, it would take yeah, I, I, that's very, 
I think that would be very, a very profound point to make. I just don't know. We weren't able to solidly and confidently make that point with the with the civilian knowledge. It's like, it's like, we just wanted to make sure you yeah. all were on board with the recommendation before we, you know, we went to the next step of the analysis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I mean, so, so do, maybe I'm not, being, maybe I'm being and seven. And I see. So anyway, you should say if you even reduced yeah. the drug by at twenty percent or something, yeah, you know, yeah, this yeah. would be the drop. You know, this would be the drop in revenue. Yeah, if you did ten percent, if you did yeah. whatever. Uh, other teams have have taken that kind of approach without having any details. Um, and you know, what kind of an impact is is each of those um, reductions going to have on the overall revenue to the company? That's great. Okay. We could raise a question of what what are you what are you doing? If you would, if you reduce this by twenty percent, think about the impact that you're going to have. You know, with with people who are currently blah 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 blah. I mean, yes. so you don't need to sound. I think everyone's trying to say the same thing. We want you to, you, we want you to have some kind of grounding where you are comfortable making it real, yes. and you can make it real in a number of ways. Because like the financial analysis was pretty weak, even though this was, you know, focus was not supposed to be on finances. But the fact that you know government or you know New UCLA contributed five hundred thousand to the, the gentleman on the screen's point, that's like a drop on the bucket. That's like nothing. So that doesn't make a very impactful statement as far as finances go. You have to cut to the core of what Pfizer's thinking about, which is always going to be about profitability. Except um, that. Tomorrow is only about ethics, so they <laughs> could have to be with profitability. There, you cannot separate those two. It's about how you can be a profitable company and still be ethical. Yeah. You cannot leave financial yeah. impacts out of it. Um, can I ask a question? You actually can, based on how how what tomorrow is written to express. Now, <laughs> they can certainly put in people have people have not been selected because they comfortably gravitate to you know the package but the reality is they've only been called back on the ethics and they want it explained which gives you all a chance to go deeper into what you did in your thing and if there's a way to say you know something other i'm not being difficult i'm just having done this 15 years i know that the expectation is that it's about ethics this presentation really was just about ethics, though, and I have to say I'm not convinced at all by the ethical argument, um, because the problem is the focus is too much on the average consumer. The, the people who are, who are pushing these drugs, healthcare professionals, right? As the gentleman on the screen said, they are the prescribers. They know what patients need what drugs. It's not the consumer going out there trying to find a TV ad about this drug, right? So. Um, the ethics can't just be on the consumer experience. It has to capture all your stakeholders. And, and from what I heard, that's where your presentation kind of falls a bit flat. Um, is what's in it for Pfizer? Because they built up tremendous um, goodwill with the vaccine with COVID, even though they're making money hand over fist. Um, how can they capitalize on that? but still be profitable and just telling them to drop the price, you know, by, you know, whatever, 50%, you know, that's just not going to do it um, in the business world. An additional I point for you. your 10 minute uh, presentation. That means well, we all know the values. Yeah, I that. Actually. Um, so the, I, I guess I, I wasn't communicated fully, uh, but there was at least 500,000 from the government. Um, it is, it has been implied that there was more, but it was not available. And no sources will publicly disclose how much went towards R&D, but it was done, as I mentioned, in UCLA, which is a public university, publicly supported. Um, so there were other avenues as well. Um, I think that's the that we should have been a little bit clearer is that the 500,000 is continuing development, but the initial development of the drug, I mean, if it's, it's done through UCLA, if Pfizer had nothing to do with it, they didn't even acquire the drug in 2016. I want to use some insight. I want to use some insight. Pfizer gave the UCLA money. It, it's not. It's not like it was handed over. And here you can use my drug. So 
most likely Pfizer has licensed it to UCLA and UCLA is still collecting money from this drug. So oh, that's yeah, he's most like, well, likely what's happening. Well, actually, let me just add to that. Um, UCLA licensed it to Medivation first, and Medivation was then acquired okay. by Pfizer in 2016, and there, that's how they acquired the rights. And then Estelle is the one who got who licensed it separately through um, UCLA, I believe. That's so it. So I that means UCLA is still collecting money off of their profits. So just so saying that it's a public university doesn't help because that public granted university is still collecting money from the same price points. You see what I'm saying? An additional point for your 10 minute presentation would be to emphasize the mission statement. I felt that was a salient point that more or less ties everything together and could be very potent in your 10 minute presentation. Thank you, thank you. I'm just going to read again the 10 minute because you have the right to to interpret it, but I just don't want you to be misled by any of us because all of us care about the fact that you'll do really well tomorrow. And if there's a way that you can insert what Nancy was talking about while being true to this, then that's great. You have been called back by the company you gave your full presentation to for a second visit. They have asked you to speak only about the ethical aspects of the problem and to explain why your solution successfully handles any ethical issues. You will have 10 minutes. There'll be no Q&A. You, you may not use slides or video. Um, so this is a brainstorming thing of how can you... You, you took on an enormous, enormous situation. Nancy's point of the things that, that need to happen and what the other two judges have said, all of that is, is, is true. But your opportunity um, is to figure out with all that you know, how can you possibly um, figure out how a solution and it's not easy because you don't have a lot of things but then nobody does it's about how you want to put ethics together and you can do a two-pronged approach right so you can lower the price and you can you can expand the patient assistance program and it's not going to be consumers that understand that because most of them aren't going to you know have that kind of savvy knowledge it's going to be their doctors that know about that so that's another really ethical thing that the company could do. Can you explain just, what that is so that they know how to Yeah, that. so they, you know, it's basically, I mean, it's usually a portal or something on the on the website, you know, I'm Pfizer, I'm not sure it has one. Yes. Uh, maybe it's for different products and that's how you enter it in. But um, yeah, yeah you, you basically apply, you know, to show that you don't have the financial means to purchase this drug, you have a medical need for it. Um, there's no other drug on the market that would be suitable, you know, for your stage of disease. And I'm sure that you have to get some sort of, you know, um, submission from your physician, you know, attesting to this fact, but, um, they actually, you know, Pfizer and, and tons of other pharmaceutical companies have specialists who navigate this with you to figure out you know, how much money they could potentially um, subsidize, if you will, for the drug so that it makes it um, affordable for you. And they're also then talking about social responsibility. Yeah. Because that's really what the program is. is it, I mean, it is. I mean, because it's supposed to make, make um, healthcare more equitable. Right. Right. So it's not just the great health care Healthcare more equitable. Yeah. Yeah. I did that. I was going to Yeah. I mean, that's a big topic yes. yeah. even today, right? Yes. Um, healthcare no. equity. We all know. I mean, you mentioned the fact that black men are, are diagnosed two times more than, than white men are. And we know that the black community is oftentimes priced out of drugs, yes. uh, even in medical care, basic medical care. So this would be a way to um, address that very prominent social issue in our society. Um, and something that Pfizer probably already has in place, you know, in some form, how developed it is, you know, you don't know, but 
does you have really good use of their money and um, also would generate quite a bit of goodwill. Um, and it's not that they have to they have to market that reality because they're doing that when they interface with their HCPs, healthcare practitioners who are prescribing that drug. I mean, they are targeted on um, specialists in the prostate cancer space, and they will know about that possibility. They'll say, hey, I'm gonna prescribe this drug, cost a fortune. However, there is this you know, program. It will assist you. And even if it sounds mundane, the, the, big, the greatest of companies have had values that they talk about and are held accountable to. Everybody else has them. It doesn't mean that they do anything with them. But somebody like Pfizer is in a position of vulnerability based on its, its status and all of that. So just remember that words like excellence equity and um, the social responsibility that's implicit with the, uh, what is the value that would be? Well, yeah, courage is harder to yeah, fit in. Um, yeah. And I'm, I'm thinking about, well, I'm sorry, like, it's like, you know, leading, like, you know, the taking the risks and leading the way. So, I mean, there's, 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 you can support that. Right. Um, and joy is a is an interesting aspect. I guess what they're saying is it's about healing. Yeah. And so you know, ten minutes is is a is a short time, but it can be a powerful one. And I think you guys will have fun with it. Yes. Yeah. And one point um, to I, consider. One point to consider is that the disparity between African Americans contracting prostate cancer and Caucasians is in some ways the elephant in the room question. So you might delve into the, the stigma and the reluctance to get medical care that, that seems to be prominent in, in many African American communities. It's a sensitive issue, but yeah, it might be it worth is. delving into. So we've given you five trillion ideas. We have kept you almost 13 minutes longer than so you want to take your evening because you have things to do, but it was a pleasure hearing and meeting you. And um, I hope that uh, well we'll see you tomorrow or whatever i have no idea who I'm, no idea who i'm going to listen to but i wish you the best i'm sure nancy does too and malcolm as well and I, can, if I can say on behalf of the team um, thomas says there's three kind of speeches for one gives i will yeah. paraphrase but the one you give your friends the one that you actually give and then the one you give on your other right only in your mind uh, i'm sure we're all thinking of right now we should have uh, you know said these certain things um, but it's uh, fine. Now you uh, forget about today. It's late. Everything, everything is tomorrow. Okay. And thank you. I really want to say thank you guys so much for the opportunity. This is one of the biggest events in our life. And the time that you guys dedicate to us, it is truly life changing. This has been a great experience so far. So thank you guys so much. Thank, thank you. you. Yes. Good luck tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good luck tomorrow. Is this the first time? Yeah. 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 Michael, thank you. Bye.